They're coming in. Good morning and welcome to IFMA's, IFMA New York City's Workplace Technology Series number five, an introduction to Integrated Workplace Management Solutions, IWMS. This is our fifth of six webinars on workplace technology. This call is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel later this week. Please feel free to submit any questions you may have into the chat box. Also, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. At that point, if you would like to unmute yourself to ask a question, please feel free to do so. Russell Olson is the uh, founder and president of ROI Consulting Group, a firm specializing in the implementation of computer-aided facilities management and integrated workplace management software solutions. Russ is a licensed architect registered in New York and New Jersey. He's received his bachelor's degree in architecture from Pratt Institute in 1993 and his master's degree in urban environmental systems management from Pratt in 1997. He is a past vice president of the board of the Greater New York IFMA chapter, and for the past 25 years, Russ has been an adjunct professor at Pratt, teaching the technology courses in both construction management and facilities management departments, as well as the space planning and programming class for the master's degree in facilities management. Russ was awarded the Distinguished Educator of the Year Award in 2002, 2006, and 2012 by the Greater New York IFMA chapter. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Russ Olson. Thank you and welcome, Russ. All right, thank you. And I just wanna make sure before I dive into this, because I just turned sharing back on, if you guys are able to see my screen, it should be on the introduction slide. Yes. Yeah. All right, fantastic. So I'm gonna quickly go through our agenda for this call. I'm gonna give everybody a, a real deep dive into integrated workplace management solutions, uh, covering a, a variety of different topics here. Uh, everything from what these solutions are, uh, what to consider when selecting one, implementing uh, one, as well as uh, what do you need to know on it day two basis for ongoing maintenance and upkeep and provide some sample use cases as well as uh, some explanations for ROI analysis, business case justification, and those types of things. Uh, here, just the high level learning objectives. Uh, we were trying to get this uh, certified for continuing education credits. Um, so just want to cover those briefly, all right, so we don't have to walk you guys through all of that. I just want to dive straight into it. So I'm sure uh, a lot of you today on the call are all in the facilities management world. So you know a lot of the issues uh, outside of COVID, which is the hottest topic these days, but I really didn't want to make this all about COVID. So I'm going to try to keep this just focused on general issues that are uh, facing all facility managers, things like uh, how much space do we own or occupy? How much of that is vacant or occupied? Uh, what's happening today or tomorrow in that space? What are our future plans? Uh, what could we be doing to accommodate those plans? How much of its own, the least? Uh, how do I reduce my churn or even back to the COVID situation? How do I make sure that I've got people amply spaced out or providing a safe workplace for them? And what is this space costing me? Lastly, are we managing it efficiently? And can I do more with less? Which is one of the other biggest issues we're finding as facilities teams keep cutting their staff. Uh, so they have fewer and fewer resources available. So one of the things we'll see in, this, in a few minutes is just how these systems lend themselves to that situation. And as I go through, so what exactly is an IWMS system? So uh, the acronym IWMS stands for Integrated Workplace Management Solution or Software or System. I've heard the S used a lot of different ways. So just keep that in mind um, that people kind of throw around the S in a variety of different ways. Uh, but some of you might also have heard the term CAFM or Computer Aided Facilities Management. And a lot of people use those interchangeably as well. So I wanted to explain a, a few different acronyms as well as give a little bit of the history and background as to how we got to IWMS. So uh, 
when these systems first started to evolve, there was originally CAD or computer-aided design or drafting tools. Sometimes you see it with the 2Ds. Uh, but CAD was originally a drafting tool, which is still used today, something like an AutoCAD, which is probably one of the industry leaders in that space. I think they have a huge market share. Uh, next came along was computer-aided facilities management or CAFM. Um, around the same time was computerized maintenance management systems or CMMS. Um, these two things, uh, again, can sometimes be combined or uh, more often separate and referred to as point solutions when used separately. Uh, a point solution, more or less, is a software system that does one particular thing very well, uh, as opposed to an integrated solution, which does lots of things, arguably maybe not as well, but uh, some of them may be evolved and have gotten much better and do uh, or go much deeper in a lot of different areas. Um, next along came CIFM or KIFM, I've heard it called, which is Computer Integrated Facilities Management. So as these solutions started to evolve back, uh, I'd say uh, late 80s, early 90s, um, some of the more marketing savvy companies uh, wanted to differentiate themselves from the pack. Uh, so they started coming up with different buzzwords and at the time, the technology started to shift and change a little, and solutions started to become more integrated, or the technology evolved in ways that allowed a CAFM system to connect to a CMMS system so that you had information shared between the two. And those marketing savvy companies started to refer to themselves as CIFM, or Computer Integrated Facilities Management, to differentiate themselves from the older solutions on the market. Uh, but then next came integrated uh, workplace management systems, which that term was actually coined by Gartner Group uh, back in the early 2000s. And I'll get into that in one second. And lastly, now the latest and greatest that I'm seeing thrown around is IWMS Plus, which is basically an IWMS system married to IoT uh, technology, which is Internet of Things. Those are sensors that allow you to connect or interact with your workplace. And clicking on the wrong screen. So here, uh, as I said, back in 2004, Michael Bell, who was one of the analysts from the Gartner Group, which is a uh, IT analyst company, um, they put together the first comprehensive guide to these solutions and offered it out to the masses. Uh, this was probably the first time where somebody formalized what was the Wild West because um, you had a lot of solutions with varying degrees of functionality. Um, some of them claimed to have functionality that they really didn't have any depth in that area, but it was really more uh, a lot of different vendors jockeying for position or trying to establish themselves as sort of the end all solution to do everything. And so what Michael did was actually coin this term um, as well as put some uh, brackets around it so that there was a more formal understanding of what can constitute an IWMS system. At its basics, uh, an IWMS system or, enabled to, or in order to be considered an IWMS solution, you had to have uh, at least, I think it was four out of the six below, or sometimes you see it referred to five, uh, but real estate and lease management, um, space and move management, maintenance management or maintenance and operations, uh, asset management, project management, and environmental sustainability, which came along a little bit later than the others, but is actually probably one of the, the hotter modules that we're seeing a lot of demand for these days. Okay. Um, Gartner produced that report up until a couple of years ago, and then they stopped, and I'm not 100% sure why, but uh, to fill that void, a similar uh, uh, IT analyst type firm stepped in. Uh, they were called Verdantix. So Verdantix started producing their version of what Gartner called their magic quadrant. Um, this is the latest one I was able to get, which I believe was uh, earlier this year. And the way these quadrants work, is you'll see along the left-hand side is capabilities. So starting in the lower left-hand corner, the higher up you go, the more capabilities your solution has. And along the bottom, starting from the left-hand side, uh, the further to the right you go, the more momentum your solution has. Uh, and you'll notice that everybody in the top right-hand quadrant 
are considered probably the, the most comprehensive systems in this space, as well as probably having the most depth and most momentum, meaning that they're, uh, they're starting to take off, more people are adopting their solution. Uh, one thing to point out, I did list uh, everybody that's on this particular quadrant uh, off to the right in uh, alphabetical order. So there's no favorites there, although uh, the one purple one is arguably the leader in this space right now as ranked for by Verdantix. But one key thing to note is I was showing uh, the Verdantix report to somebody recently, and I had a copy from uh, 2019 and another one from 2017. And almost every name on the quadrant was different from one to the next. Or I'd say easily 70% uh, of them had changed. And that's due to a great deal of mergers and acquisitions that have been happening in this space over the last several years. So I'll talk about that in a little while as well. Um, here, the five pillars of, of IWMS. Um, that's a term you'll hear thrown around. And I grabbed uh, some marketing slides from a variety of different vendors that you saw on the previous page. Uh, they all have a very similar, uh, a lot of them have this donut shape that outlines how all the different modules within the solution interact. Um, but more or less, they all fall into the same buckets that I mentioned previously. And you can see down the middle, uh, real estate, capital projects, uh, facilities management, um, this one has workplace reservations, operations and maintenance, uh, energy management. Um, there's more or less similar veins as you go from one to the next. So very similar. Everybody's just taking their own slightly different approach to uh, how, they're, how they're conveying their message. Um, at its essence, though, these are the major pillars that uh, if you distill all of that marketing noise down to its basics, they fall into these buckets here. As I said before, uh, space, real estate, operations and maintenance, project management, and then sustainability and energy management. Uh, as I mentioned in a previous slide, asset management is uh, sometimes uh, isolated, but really more or less assets transcend all the different modules here, which is why you'll see some people might keep it separate or include it. Um, so that's really uh, the best I could explain there is because it touches on everything. Uh, it's sometimes hard to justify as treating it as its own separate module. All right. Just to give you an idea as to what makes up each one of those different modules that I just showed, uh, space management, where more or less, if you could imagine uh, things like AutoCAD plans married to a database. So here I have uh, space management, which is more or less the who sits where, what department do they belong to, how much space do they occupy, um, really enables you to wrap your arms around the actual physical space um, and what's happening in that space. Certain things that uh, are also included here is occasionally the integration with uh, some kind of CAD platform. And now more often than not, we're starting to see vendors introduce some integration with BIM or building information modeling. Uh, so systems like Revit, who's probably one of the uh, more recognizable names in the build, building information modeling space, um, that's starting to gain a lot more momentum in the facilities or IWMS world. Uh, more or less recognized as a design and construction tool, but it is uh, starting to gain a lot more momentum as a, uh, a management tool for the day two management of the space. Um, here, meeting room management, you saw some vendors broke this out separately. Uh, this is one that's actually also gaining a lot of momentum due to COVID uh, more than anything else. Uh, it was fairly popular as people started to move to agile workspace, uh, enabling people to reserve space when they were going to be in the office or when they needed a, a specific type of space. So it becomes a little bit more agile. You work in an environment that's conducive to whatever task you're trying to accomplish for that day. Uh, but now with COVID, we're seeing a lot of our clients actually having their employees make reservations so that they know who's actually going to be in the space that day. They could cap how many people have made reservations for the day. Um, limit which spaces that they could actually reserve so that we can actually enforce social distancing. 
And now we're seeing more of our clients start to impose a uh, check-in. So the people that reserve the space actually have to check into that space. So we know that whoever reserved it actually showed up and was there that day. So if we need to do any kind of contact tracing, it enables that or makes it much simpler. Um, other features within space management, uh, strategic planning or uh, scenario planning. These are the ability to do forecasts, what ifs, um, what if something changes in my portfolio? What would that look like? How would that impact me? Um, or even facilitating things like large scale restacks or moves or consolidations. Uh, move management, because I just mentioned that there in the restack planning, um, sometimes is segregated into two buckets, uh, the actual orchestration or planning and orchestration of large scale moves or the day to day onesie twosie moves that happen throughout the organization. And sometimes the systems have completely separate and distinct uh, ways of handling those two types of moves. Um, sensor integration and utilization, as I mentioned before, uh, the IoT part of this is also starting to gain a lot of momentum. Uh, we are seeing more clients now uh, trying to wrap their arms around just how their space is being utilized, how often are people actually there, uh, where are they actually working when they are in the office? And sensors enable us to actually monitor that much more closely and report against it so that we can make much more accurate decisions around how we're actually going to proceed with our space or the utilization of our space moving forward. Uh, next here, I have real estate and lease management, where uh, more or less this is the uh, management of the leases, or I've heard lease administration is one piece of it. And there is a distinction between these that I think sometimes people just blur together. But lease administration is more or less um, the ability to track the terms and conditions of the lease, uh, critical dates associated with a lease. So uh, my when is my renewal? Or when do I have a, a ROFO or something along those lines? Um, so the ability to track those things, as well as some of the basic financials, like my lease rentable square footage, so I can do chargebacks if I need to by tying that to space management. Um, on the flip side, though, the lease accounting or lease financials is another aspect to lease management. And I think you'll also hear lease compliance thrown around as well. Um, that's one where it's, uh, although bundled together on the lease and uh, real estate, it is very specific and very different. Um, something like the lease accounting standards for FASB, IFRS, IASB, you'll hear some of those thrown around. Um, those were the new regulations that were put in, in effect over the last year or two by the Federal Accounting Standards Board. Um, so any publicly traded company, I believe, needed to be in compliance with those standards uh, by a specific date. And so these solutions allowed you to uh, automate or I guess uh, enhance the ability to track and report against that for compliance purposes. Other things you'll also see here, um, some of the solutions will allow you to do things like uh, site selection and track this all the way through the entire life cycle. So um, doing the analysis on where you should uh, actually put a facility, uh, tracking all of the negotiations once you have a final lease, and then managing that throughout the life of the lease so that you know uh, what are your responsibilities as part of the lease or what's the landlord responsible for. Um, you also have the ability in some solutions like this because they are integrated. That's probably a point I should reiterate throughout this is um, like I said, uh, having lease information tied back to space management gives us the ability to do chargebacks. And that's basically allowing you to charge each department based off of the al space allocated to them uh, or their proportionate share of space. Whereas uh, I can also tie my lease data into maintenance and operations so that before I run out and spend money on a vendor coming in to uh, fix something or repair something, uh, I'll have an alert let me know whether or not that's the landlord's responsibility and direct me to the landlord as opposed to uh, bringing in a vendor and incurring unnecessarily uh, unnecessary charges. 
Next one here, operations and maintenance. Uh, you'll see an awful lot more bullet points on this one in particular. Uh, operations and maintenance is actually split into two different parts. So one is what I'd like to call demand or reactive maintenance. That is your facilities help desk type functionality. That's it's too hot, it's too cold, my chair is broken. Really the, the things that just pop up unexpectedly throughout the course of the day. Uh, and these solutions allow you to have a variety of different interfaces into that. Um, so the end user or requester uh, within the organization, um, a lot of the solutions now have mobile tools that allow people to submit these types of requests on the go. So if you happen to be walking through the building and notice there's a spill on the floor, uh, you don't have to wait till you get back to your desk or you don't have to stop and call somebody. You can immediately just open your phone, uh, submit a, a service request. Some allow you to even take photographs and uh, submit those along so that when the facilities team receives those, they know exactly what they're up against or know exactly what they're, you're talking about. So they don't have to worry about you being technical enough to convey the problem back to them. Uh, and then in addition, we also have the planned or preventative maintenance. That's more or less the stuff that happens on a regular schedule. So every three months you need to replace a filter or every six months you need to come in and you need to uh, perform an inspection on a piece of equipment. Uh, that's the planned preventative maintenance part of this. And these solutions allow you to tie that back to the assets where I said before assets kind of transcend everything. Um, so I could actually see the maintenance history against an asset. If I wanted to do any kind of reporting, I could see what my total cost of ownership on an asset looks like based off of what the initial cost was, as well as what the maintenance I've done to that asset has totaled up to over the course of time. Um, additionally here, I have the ability to do a lot more stuff and I don't wanna to get too granular, but um, some of the solutions allow us to track parts on hand, like in a storeroom. So every time a maintenance technician goes out to perform any kind of service, if they need to pull parts out like uh, light bulbs, for instance, the solution will allow them to note that they've taken two light bulbs out of the storeroom. And when those uh, thresholds are hit in the storeroom, like for instance, once I'm down to my last six light bulbs, it could trigger an alert to have me automatically go out and order more light bulbs. Okay, and then lastly, there are uh, mobile field services or mobile tools for the technicians that allow them to actually receive all of this information while they're on the go, as well as interact with the solution so that they don't have to wait till they're back at the desk or they don't have to print stuff out, fill it in and then hand it off to somebody else to manually fat finger in at some point. Um, it's real time or close to real time. So if a company is looking to really do any kind of reporting and analytics against the performance of their maintenance team, uh, having the mobile aspect of this enables them to get uh, updates real time as to when did the technician arrive? When was the work completed? If it was put on hold, why? Uh, and for how long? So all of these things become timestamped in the solution so that you have the ability to run uh, reports or have KPIs as to how long it took between these different timestamps to give you a real deep insight into how well the maintenance aspect of your company is functioning. Uh, capital project management more or less allows you to have a project management solution built into the system. Um, and when I talk about the, the integrated parts of this, if you can imagine when I have the, the lease management, once I actually sign the lease and I uh, have the space is now available to me, here's where the capital project management part of these solutions kicks in. Um, this allows you to do things like tracking the overall schedule for a project, the budget. Um, if you have multiple projects going on throughout your, uh, your portfolio, you could actually slice and dice that again so I could roll up uh, project costs so I could see what my capital project expenditure looks like as well as do budgeting for uh, future years or future periods. And should be the last one here is sustainability or energy management. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot more interest in this particular area. Uh, I know they are going to be enacting new legislation for New York where the buildings are going to be getting uh, ratings similar to the restaurants had. 
uh, where you'll have a grade uh, A, B, C, F um, that you'll hang in front of the building. And that's gonna be based off of your energy consumption in the building or just how efficient your building is. And that ultimately what we're hearing is gonna be passed down from the landlords to the tenants. And there could be uh, fines or penalties imposed for inefficient use of energy. Uh, these solutions will allow you to actually aggregate all of your energy usage data so that you'll have dashboards and reporting available to you. So you'll be able to track or get ahead of that to see what your usage trend looks like, or if you need to make adjustments to make sure that you're not going to be uh, imposed with some kind of fines because you're not, uh, you're not running a ton tight ship when it comes to how well your uh, location is actually performing from a, an energy consumption standpoint. Um, these do allow for connecting to multiple different meters, uh, as well as uh, tracking all of your expenditures, um, CO2 emissions, really any and all things around the uh, environmental sustainability for your location. And in some cases, we've seen the ability to track things like your uh, lead credits or BREAM or some of the other uh, the, the different certifications like that, where I'm able to basically just run a report to show evidence of having met any of those requirements. Okay. So I know I said an awful lot there. Um, that's really more or less just uh, kind of explaining the breadth of these systems um, because they do do an awful lot with a single package, which is the integrated part of it. Um, but here, things that you need to think about if you are going to be looking to uh, actually go out and procure a system like this, uh, more or less this kind of follows the same path regardless of who you're talking to. Uh, it all begins with a, a needs analysis. So diving into what exactly it is that your, you or your company needs, uh, being able to document that information and convey that back to the vendors so that you're actually finding a vendor that meets your requirements. Um, some of the vendors that I showed pre on that previous slide, that uh, Verdantix quadrant, well, uh, they all do at a minimum uh, all of those five pillars that we had discussed. But the key here is a lot of them go very wide and very deep, but just some deeper than others in particular areas. And that's why having your requirements uh, accurately documented really helps. Um, so you know exactly the parts and pieces that you're going to need and just how much of them you're going to need. So some of these solutions actually go really deep in one area, but maybe not so deep in another. They might have started out as a space management solution and then over time added other modules to allow them to do things like maintenance and lease management. But they might not go as deep in those areas because that was not their, their core competency or their core area of expertise. Um, Others, they might have done something similar, but they put more of an emphasis on it and built out a more comprehensive solution. This is where you need to really do your homework. And when looking at these solutions as part of the next step, which is the system selection, is make sure that you're asking very specific, very specific questions, not just can your solution do lease management. It's can your solution meet the FASB compliance requirements. Uh, big difference between the two. And that's just something to be very aware of because uh, a lot of vendors could check all the boxes on your RFI or RFP and just making sure I'm not just throwing out more acronyms and people don't know what I'm talking about. So an RFI in the software world is a request for information uh, versus an RFP, which is a request for a proposal. Uh, normally, you'll see in software, uh, an RFI goes out first, uh, which is really to gather information from a variety of different vendors uh, to narrow down the number of vendors you're looking at by uh, removing the ones that don't necessarily meet your requirements on a first pass. The RFP, or actually you'll sometimes even see an RFQ thrown in there, which is a request for qualifications. Uh, again, just further narrowing down who you're looking at based off of how qualified they are to meet your requirements. The RFP part is usually where you'll see pricing come into play because at that point you'll have narrowed it down and have your requirements uh, specified uh, so much so that somebody will be able to give you pricing at that point in time. 
Um, the implementation part of it, and here's another big point of distinction, because um, now we've seen a lot of companies as they've moved to the cloud or as they've gone in the SaaS direction, SaaS, which is software as a service, uh, they some feel that the implementation part of this uh, isn't as critical or uh, might be overly simplified. So we've seen instances where a, a client will go out, uh, go through the uh, needs analysis, go through the system selection, select a vendor, um, and sometimes select them based off of the fact that they were low bidder and not realizing that their implementation costs didn't include anything more than just training, uh, where more or less that means they're going to show you how the system works. And then the onus is on you to actually do the heavy lifting, which is loading all of the data, doing all of the configuration, um, which might not seem like a lot, but depending on the size of your portfolio, as well as some of your in-house capabilities, it might be a daunting task. That is one area where we've seen uh, quite a bit over the years where someone says, well, we've got in-house resources that know how to do like CAD, for instance. And you say, yes, you do, but more often than not, they have a day job. And when you've got a several million square foot portfolio, it's actually very time consuming to format the CAD drawings to be able to use them within a majority of these systems. So that's where you have to weigh whether or not your in-house resources really makes sense versus uh, having a vendor that does this and only this come in and do it in a more timely fashion, more or not. Um, lastly, support. Uh, this is another one to think about as well as training, which was one of the last items on the implementation. Um, another area where we see people cut corners or try to save money by, uh, by striking out some of the training or reducing the amount of training, uh, definitely not the way to go. Um, these solutions are very complex, uh, although they could be simplified or more user-friendly, but at the end of the day, they are very complicated systems that can and do do a lot. So you want to make sure that you've got your team uh, trained and ready to use the solution, because otherwise, if they don't have the proper training, um, either it'll be used uh, half-heartedly, um, the data in there might not be great because people aren't using it consistently, or people just get frustrated and just don't use it because it's simpler and easier for them to circumvent it and get the job done than it is to go back and get trained correctly to use this correctly. Um, and ongoing support, as I mentioned here, this is really after the system has been procured, uh, set up, team has been trained, now you're out of the gates, you're off and running and using the system. Um, day two support is something else to consider because sometimes uh, it's like painting a bridge. <laughs> Once you get to that point, Things might have changed. You might onboard new locations. You might have uh, new processes put in place or a curveball like COVID thrown your direction, whereby you might have to go back and constantly fine tune and adjust these solutions. So it's really, uh, you know, you're not done or you're never done in this situation because there's always something else you could do better or you could do to fine tune how you're using these solutions. Um, some other things just to think about when implementing these solutions. Uh, as I said, where do I get started? A great point or a great point uh, to begin with is either Gartner or Vedantix. Uh, not only do they put out these annual reports, they do have a lot of material. Um, most of it is paid. Uh, a lot of large companies. If you check with your IT department, you'll probably find out that they have a subscription to one or both of these companies that'll entitle you access to these systems. So that's something else to think about. Um, otherwise you can just go on their website and you can order this. Um, they, are, uh, they are absolutely fantastic. Um, they have evolved over the years. I've seen them there 30, 40 page documents that give you a really deep dive into the solutions as well as each of the vendors that they've evaluated. So it does save you an awful lot of time and, and aggravation in trying to ramp up, understand the entire marketplace, and then uh, think you're an expert and be able to move forward. Um, they do break it down for you to make it a lot easier. Uh, 
the number of programs available, as you just saw in that last slide, there's well over 15 or so that they actually have as part of their ranking. But that doesn't mean that's all of them. There are other solutions out there that might not have all five pillars covered. They might only do four out of five or three out of five. So therefore they don't qualify on that particular list. Uh, they actually uh, wouldn't make it here, but uh, when looking at your requirements, you might not need all five areas. You might be able to cut a couple of corners or find one of these other solutions that would uh, meet all of your requirements, but might not have never ever made it onto a list like this. Okay, uh, next one here, the, the average cost. Uh, that's sort of a loaded question. Um, these systems run the gamut and a lot of the pricing is uh, gonna vary from vendor to vendor. Leveling any kind of RFP responses is a daunting task because you'll see they are all over the place. Um, some of them, just the software alone is going to be based off of uh, the number of modules that you're going to purchase. So sometimes it's an a la carte pricing structure where you're going to pay for each module. Um, sometimes there are additional features that you're going to pay for as well. So let's say like the mobile app might be a few dollars extra. Um, user licenses. So not only do you pay for a module, but you pay for how many users are using those modules. Um, there might be a variety of different types of users. So sometimes you'll have an administrative user, which has sort of uh, all access pass to everything, uh, a workplace or a power user, which is the person that's going to roll up their sleeves and use the system to do their job on a daily basis. Um, and then you have these light users, which might be like uh, a technician that just logs in to open and close a work order or uh, a general employee who's going to submit a service request, or uh, you might have somebody who's like a coordinator for a team that might have slightly different access because they could go in and put in requests or coordinate the moves for their department. So that's something else to understand is how the different vendors license and package their product to be able to find one that actually uh, closely aligns with what you're envisioning for a solution for your company. Uh, we have seen others that actually price based off of either the number of locations, so how many different buildings, um, some based off square footage. So if you've got um, larger foot uh, floor plates, you might be charged more than somebody that has a more densely packed uh, location. Um, or if you're a much larger company, you might have just three people in your facilities team so if you paid by user licenses, it might be cheaper to pay for those three user licenses than it would to pay for a square footage price because you've got 20 million square feet around the globe. Um, so those are the other things that you need to weigh from a cost perspective. On the flip side, that's the software itself, but then normally you're going to pay to have somebody do the implementation. And as I said previously, that can run the gamut from paying for a few days worth of training and then going and doing the rest of the implementation yourself to full turnkey white glove delivery or anywhere in between or some kind of hybrid. Um, but the implementation actually is an area where you're gonna wanna spend some time to really scope it out, to make sure you're getting exactly what you think you're, you're looking for. And it's been priced accordingly. Um, again, you don't want people to come in with the lowest price and think you're getting everything and only to find out that you're only getting uh, uh, something that scratches the surface on the delivery. Uh, so there, it also depends on the size of your organization, how many modules you're implementing. Um, sometimes there are other complexities like integrations with other systems internally that could also alter the price structure. Um, if you, I forgot to integrate with five or six different solutions. So like your HR system or the IT ticketing system or uh, an internal financial solution, that's also going to possibly drive the cost up on the implementation side of things, um, as well as having very complicated workflows where some of the systems will allow you to automate parts and pieces of your workflow. And if you've got very complex, let's say routing and approval instructions, that could also uh, 
be cause for slightly higher implementation costs because you have to take into consideration the fact that some of these things take time to actually build uh, and then deploy. Um, some of the pitfalls, I think I've mentioned quite a few of them, is just making sure that you're getting what you think you're getting. Um, I did mention on the software side that uh, some of these solutions go deeper than others. Uh, having the product demonstrations is critical before you go out and buy something, but also putting together a script that the vendors need to follow when you're doing your evaluation is another recommendation that I make to the majority of our clients that are, are uh, out evaluating solutions. And the reason I say that is because if I have a solution that's weak in one area and strong in another, and you give me one hour to demonstrate it, I'm going to spend uh, 55 minutes of that call demonstrating the pieces that I'm very strong in, leaving only a few minutes at the end of the call to quickly blast through the areas where I'm weak so that you don't necessarily latch on to just how weak I am there. And by the time you've looked at two, three of these systems, they start to blend together. So the other thing to also make sure you have is some kind of an evaluation matrix for your team so that as you're watching these, you can make notes, you can rank the different vendors on each area where they have features or functionality that you're interested in. So that if you need to go back, um, you don't have to say, hey, which one was it that does this? Or um, wasn't that one? Or didn't that one particular vendor have a feature I wanted and I don't really remember? Um, most of them will allow you to record sessions. So just like we're doing right now, if I was demonstrating the software to you, I can actually, one, uh, follow along with the script you've given me, two, have your team actually go through the evaluation matrix and rank uh, how well I'm meeting your requirements. And lastly, ask to record the session so that if you need to refer back to it, you can always go back and see exactly what was said or what was shown and have that as uh, part of your evaluation materials. Uh, we did have a situation a couple of years ago where a vendor uh, made a reference to having functionality that they didn't necessarily have. The customer ended up buying their solution and only to find out during the implementation, it did not have the feature that they were looking for. And it turned out that the client who was dumbfounded because they said they asked several times during the presentation and were told uh, explicitly by the vendor that it did do exactly what they were looking for. Uh, so they were a little upset went out on YouTube, I believe, and found a video uh, sales recording that was done by this vendor. And in the actual recording, they specifically say they have this functionality that now was no way to be found. So the vendor called or the client called out the vendor on it and they went back and actually built the functionality the client was looking for just because they, they kind of caught them in the middle of it and it was the right thing to do. Uh, in providing that, not necessarily lying. <laughs> Don't condone the lying part of it. Uh, lastly here is uh, just making sure that you know what your organization really needs versus uh, trying to pack in every buzzword or every latest fad or trend that you've read about in the trades. Um, sometimes things like I mentioned uh, BIM. Uh, BIM is a great tool, but for your typical plain vanilla office space, trying to use that as a facilities management tool or day two facilities and real estate tool. Um, yes, you can actually make a case for there being some benefits, but it's probably going to be outweighed by the amount of effort necessary, necessarily to get it up and running, but also to maintain it on a go forward basis. Um, so that might not be a great fit. If you don't have in-house resources that are going to keep a, a Revit model updated on a regular basis, you might not want to necessarily go in that direction, even though it's the hottest topic in every trade magazine right now. Um, so you, you might want to find a solution that uh, might have those capabilities that you could grow into, but biting off that too early, uh, you might end up falling on your face or wasting a lot of time and money unnecessarily. So things to understand is what do you really need versus uh, what are you asking for? Uh, some other parts and pieces here uh, in the cloud or on premises. Um, I'd say probably 90, 95% of the projects that we've been involved with in the last 
two years have all been in the cloud or SaaS, again, software as a service. So it's hosted by the vendor uh, on their servers in the cloud. So it's pretty much accessible from pretty much anywhere. Um, no longer sitting on your servers, on your company's network. Um, most of that has gone away. We do have a few holdouts, uh, but they have very specific reasons why. Like for instance, um, we have a, a power and energy company that is in Canada. Um, federal rules mandate that their data uh, can't leave the country. It's got to have certain types of security. If you can imagine, you don't want the blueprints for a power plant out there on the internet where just anybody could get to it. So that sort of makes sense, but the security for these solutions is getting better and better. Uh, you will hear things like uh, Amazon or AWS, Amazon's hosting offering. A lot of vendors are using their hosting. And the reason being because they've built in a lot of those security requirements and even to take it one step further, they have things like FedRAMP and MedRAMP, uh, terms that you might hear. Uh, if you're in healthcare, there are all types of uh, requirements around HIPAA, uh, the patient privacy laws and stuff, where they have to be very careful as to how that data is protected. And when you go to Amazon, if you go with their MedRAMP offering, uh, it basically means that they've built in additional security and privacy features into that offering to satisfy HIPAA compliance or the healthcare uh, vertical in that offering. On the FedRAMP side, if you're in federal government uh, or even local government, um, they've built out all the requirements for that into an offering. Just makes it much easier when you're going to buy one of these systems, ultimately you're gonna to have to bring in the IT team who's going to have to vet this, make sure it's secure, make sure that it checks all their boxes and all their requirements. And if you have those certifications up front by a vendor, it just streamlines that entire process. Uh, other pieces, we already mentioned the features and functionality. Again, the systems go very wide, very deep. Um, integration with other systems. You'll hear the term API thrown out a lot now. And uh, all the APIs are is the ability to allow these systems to communicate with each other. Uh, and there's a variety of different ways that that's handled, but more or less simplifying or oversimplifying it is when you see a solution has their APIs published, it means that they have uh, a mechanism for you to connect their tool to other tools uh, most of the common uh, systems that you're going to find out there should be able to accommodate this type of integration. Uh, AutoCAD versus BIM compatibility. I mentioned that a few times during this uh, call and here. Uh, AutoCAD more or less is two-dimensional floor plans versus uh, BIM or Revit, which you know, you'll hear people use that interchangeably. Revit is just a type of BIM solution or a brand more or less, but those are your 3D object models where you could put a lot more intelligence into your 3D model. Uh, like for instance, your mechanical equipment so that by connecting that directly to an IWMS solution, I'm able to pull in all of the details around all of my MEP assets. Uh, so I automatically can build my asset management library and then from there, leverage other information. Not only do I have all of the attributes for those assets directly from my BIM model, but I can then start to build out my maintenance and operations for my planned and preventative maintenance routines for those particular assets. And we've even seen some solutions where um, I can search my model right from my mobile device or if I'm a technician and I need to go out and inspect or repair a piece of equipment, It'll show me exactly where it is in the context of that model from my mobile device. So I don't have to go back to my desk and uh, pull up a model, go looking for it or anything like that. I, uh, I can actually do that on the go from a mobile device now in some situations. Uh, this next one's a little tricky, raster versus vector. Uh, Going to really geek out on you for a second, but um, this is just basically the types of pictures that are used by these solutions. Um, raster is, is more or less like a picture. Uh, so when you open up like a JPEG or a GIF or a, a PNG file, it's a photograph. Um, and if you zoom in a lot, 
you'll notice that it starts to get a little pixelated. Like you see those little squares and it gets a little uh, blurry the more you zoom in, as opposed to vector, which is what most of the programs like an AutoCAD is a vector-based solution. And what that means is I could zoom in a hundred times. That line's always gonna be crisp and clean. So with the vector-based versus raster-based, um, where you'll see is a lot of the newer space management solutions on, on the market now are going in the direction of raster-based systems. Um, one, they're a little easier to deal with, um, not as technical as the vector. Uh, they are a little faster on the web, um, but they can't do things like uh, chargebacks or square footage takeoffs because the, they are not scaled the way vector-based drawings are scaled. So if you imagine an AutoCAD drawing, I could do square footage takeoffs or measurements or anything like that. Um, on a raster image, like if I'm looking at a picture like this one right now, if I needed to know how long that piece of molding was along the back wall, I have no way of telling. If this was in a vector-based system, I'd be able to take dimensions from point A to point B and it would tell me. Uh, so there are trade-offs there, but you need to be aware of because we have seen uh, instances where somebody said, oh, this one's great, it's pretty, it's user, uh, uh, simple for all the users, and I love it, I'm gonna go with that, and six months later, try to run a report for how much square footage a department's using, and they can't, because it's just not baked into that type of solution. Um, so things just to be aware of, dots on plans versus uh, actual polylines, two different things from a technical perspective. Uh, mobility, this is another area where we see a lot of people just assume because everything works on my phone these days. When I'm using these solutions, I should be able to do everything from my phone. Uh, the vendors are making great strides in that direction, but um, some people are uh, a little further along than others. Uh, we see this is an area where you'll continue to see improvement. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've seen some vendors now where I can actually access my BIM model from my phone, but also keep in mind, um, your phone is only so big. Uh, if you've got a million square foot, 50 story building, and you're trying to locate assets on it on a uh, six inch iPhone, um, you might wanna bring a, a magnifying glass with you or something because there's only so much real estate you have on that screen. And you have to say to yourself, just how feasible is it to think that somebody's actually gonna be doing that type of stuff from a mobile device? Uh, ease of use we mentioned, um, scope of implementation support I've mentioned here. So don't wanna really beat a dead horse. Um, just a quick illustration, because I did mention SaaS or uh, hosting in the cloud versus on-premise. Uh, one of the other advantages is uh, not only we're seeing things where the costs have actually come down considerably, it used to be at a, about a three-year break-even when you looked at the overall costs comparing the two. Um, now, one of the other drivers is with SaaS, you could get that environment stood up much quicker and time is money. So instead of waiting for hardware to be deployed and uh, having everything in place to begin the implementation, when you're going to a vendor that actually provides uh, a hosted solution, uh, as soon as you sign the contract and pay your bill, they turn on the environment, you're ready to go in, I've seen it done within hours, as opposed to in the past, sometimes we'd have to wait months for the IT team to have all of the hardware and infrastructure in place to begin a project when it was on premise. Now the cost savings. Um, one of the things, and just to tell a little bit of a background story here, because I know we're coming up on time real quick, but um, we had a client of ours a number of years ago that was putting together their uh, business case justification for a new system. And they went on the internet and they found a bunch of really vague information, um, kind of like this, like real estate and facilities management costs are the second largest expense behind payroll and that type of thing. And then they also found other, other claims like by implementing a uh, IWMS solution, 10% uh, cost savings if you paid uh, several million dollars a year in real estate costs would result in several million dollars in cost savings. But, but that was it. 
Um, you saw a lot of these claims, but they didn't necessarily explain how. And when she presented this to the CFO, uh, the qu first question was, oh, really? How? And to that, she had absolutely no response. So came back and asked for our help. I had a team of three or four people spent about two weeks scouring the internet looking for uh, really detailed information to support those claims and was just coming up empty. So around the same time, we had another client that was asked a similar question by uh, their finance person. Um, they were looking to know how much was spent to date and can we quantify our cost savings? Because simply put, if we spent a dollar but saved $10, uh, if they went out and spent $10 more, would we save $100? And now we, uh, we had a few people asking the same question. So what we started to do was looking for uh, ways where we could quantify these kinds of savings. Uh, real simple and easy, but we had, and I'm going to talk a little bit faster as we're coming up on time here, but we had instances where people were tracking space that was allocated to a department as occupied, even though nobody sat there. Um, you can see here in this particular case, we found a client had 421 instances of that going on in their building. And we found there to be an average of 121 rentable square feet per space times the 421 spaces times 50 rentables or $50 per square foot was the uh, rent rate. That was uh, by just recapturing those spaces and being able to repurpose them. It was an annual cost, I'll call it a cost avoidance of about two and a half million dollars. Now we have other instances here as I go through it where people were assigned to more than one space, which is a huge no-no usually, unless it's like real senior level executives. But in one instance, we had a client where their IT team was servicing uh, two different buildings on a campus but there were separate facilities teams managing each building. So they weren't keeping track of this. Once we put a solution in place, we found that there were 16 people in one email, we captured 16 people from the IT team that had desks in both locations. Again, following that same math, as uh, simple as recapturing 16 workspaces resulted in almost $100,000 a year cost savings. We were able to now take those desks back and allocate them to other people and again, $100,000 cost savings, quick and easy to find. Um, and I'm gonna flip through a little bit more. This goes into utilization, um, finding spaces that were underutilized. Now we're either doing this through card swipe data and assuming somebody swiped in, so they were there for the day, or better yet, if we are able to deploy sensors, um, coming up with other similar savings. You, know, you have spaces where they're being underutilized now we're moving clients into agile workspace where instead of having everybody with a dedicated seat per person, we're going to a neighborhood where people could come in and share desks or have uh, different ratios, like, like a three to one person to desk ratio within the team, driving that cost down, but increasing utilization. Uh, improvements in workflow. Uh, so we sat down and started documenting the process for move requests uh, before and after to show uh, enormous cost savings once a solution was put in place for a single location, anywhere from 70 to $140,000 a year in savings. Uh, the nice part was, and let me skip by this silly animation, was when we started to go back and look at this, and sorry, I didn't realize all these animations are in here, so I'll click really fast. But in a case like that, where the software and the implementation costs were about 400,000, uh, we looked at a, an annual cost savings that we were able to quantify. That's not everything. Those were only the parts and pieces we were able to pinpoint, uh, worked out to about two and a half million dollars. And then we were asked by most of the finance teams to project that out over five years. So an initial spend of about 400,000 was projected out to about a $14 million savings over a five year period. Um, similarly, looking at a variety of different customers, same thing here, about a quarter million dollar spend. Uh, we were able to pinpoint savings. And again, this is not every savings. These are only the ones we were able to identify and then quantify where we look at about $100,000 a year savings or half a million or so over the five year period. And I'm gonna flip through these because it's really, you'll see the same type of trend. 
uh, we're here is about $30,000 and we were able to find an immediate return on that investment. Um, and then projecting that out over the next couple of years. And I'm sorry, cause I did a lot more talking than I thought I was going to. So I'm just gonna flip through these fast and maybe just open this up for questions. If we have a few minutes or did I run over and lose everybody? No, you're okay, Russ, uh, but certainly if anyone has any questions, they can uh, send them. Uh, Russ, would you be okay with providing your email address so there could be a follow-up? Yep. That I'll would be great. Put it in the chat window. Yep, that would be terrific because we are coming up on the hour. I want to thank our sponsors for today's webinar, and certainly, Russ, you've done an outstanding job. This information was really quite fascinating, and I would love to hear a part two if we could. Oh, we've got a couple. Oh, just thank yous. Great job. You're welcome. So, Russ, uh, yeah, if you could uh, just provide your email, then anyone does have any questions, she can. They can certainly follow up with you directly. That would be great. Awesome. Again, thank you to our sponsors oh. for this yep, uh, opportunity. On. We really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Awesome right. job. Alrighty, have a great day, everyone. Thank you for attending. We appreciate it.